Hi, this is Kendrick with worldmedicalschool.org. Uh, we have recently changed over from the medschool.com. We'll talk more about that after we talk about vertigo. Vertigo is one of those problems that a lot of doctors uh, kind of wince at when it comes, it comes in the door because it can be pretty complicated. And a lot of the, uh, a lot of the problems associated with vertigo are hard to treat. But we're going to talk about some of the ways that you can actually make a real difference for your patients with vertigo. So vertigo is going to be a problem with any of the, uh, any of the parts of your brain or your, um, or your inner ear that affect uh, your balance. And uh, so that could be the inner ear, uh, the vestibular nerve, uh, vestibular nu nuclei, or problems with the cerebellum. <coughs> So the problems I've got here at the top, um, benign paroxysmal, paroxysmal positional vertigo, labyrinthitis, vestibular neuritis, uh, Meniere's disease, vestibular migraine. These are some of the most common problems and, and some of the most likely to be tested on this subject. But I've also got uh, in red here the vascular causes. These are the ones that we really want to worry about. So... Um, so that could be, uh, you know, a TIA or a stroke, and uh, there's there's a vasovagal syncope that also can cause uh, a form of dizziness, and uh, otosyphilis can also cause uh, some vertigo. So to start out with, I just want to get the really important or the really dangerous stuff out of the way so we can kind of settle down while we think about the rest of these things. Because... You don't want to miss a stroke, obviously. Um, you don't want to miss a TIA or a hemorrhage or, or a, a, any kind of a neoplasm or tumor. So if somebody comes in your office complaining of dizziness and they're over 50 and the dizziness is really bad, you know, it's, uh, it doesn't allow them to stand, then uh, you probably want to get them into the hospital real quick um, and get, uh, get an MRI or a CT figure out what's going on, um, especially if they've got you know, risk factors for cardiovascular disease like hypertension, diabetes, smoking, or a history of, of CVD. Of course, if somebody's got recent trauma and they're dizzy, it's a good idea to get them in. Uh, if they're really in severe pain, then, uh, then we want to learn more about what's going on. Abrupt onset doesn't have to be a, a serious or a uh, emergency situation, but uh, if you add it to some of these other risk factors, then then you really want to make sure that you uh, get them checked out with some imaging. And uh, other neurological symptoms, persistence after treatment. So these are the, some of the things that we want to uh, really worry about getting figured out quickly and ruling out some of the more serious causes. So now that we've we've ruled out that your patient has something life threatening, we can kind of settle down now and start thinking about uh, the different causes of, of vertigo that aren't so serious. One of the most common that you're going to run into is benign paroxysmal positional vertigo. A lot of times people will leave out either the paroxysmal or the positional, so benign positional vertigo, benign paroxysmal vertigo uh, means the same thing. And this is caused by, uh, in, in most cases, likely it's caused by a, a dislodged otolith, so a little crystal that's floating around in the semicircular canals and uh, tickling those little hair cells in there and making you feel like your head's spinning or you're spinning. Um, so the history, it's going to be lasting just a minute, and it's going to usually be uh, when you change head position, like getting out of bed, reaching overhead. Um, some of the ones that I've heard often are kind of like looking up at the shower head when they're in the shower. People have a lot of this. So uh, this is something that uh, is actually really treatable, and a lot of the doctors that I've been with haven't, uh, haven't actually done anything for it. And so it's probably something that I'm guessing is, is going... Un, uh, untreated in a lot of cases or mistreated, which we can talk about. Uh, here's a probably a, a good time to just mention the difference maybe between 
uh, vertigo and uh, and dizziness due to syncope or, or other reasons. Vertigo is usually associated with uh, a feeling that of movement, like uh, like the room is spinning, for example, um, and it usually has a little bit of a, a, a nausea associated with it. Whereas, uh, if you ever wo- stood up too fast and you got lightheaded, that's a kind of dizziness too. And, and patients will say the same thing; they'll say dizziness for either of these. But I think they're two different sensations. And so, if uh, if people feel like they're going to fall over. Um, and it's not really associated with a feeling of movement. That's a, it's probably more of a, a, a dizziness or a, a near syncope. And we'll talk about that a little bit at the end. But that's not the focus of this. So if we want to really find out if this is benign paroxysmal positional vertigo, the Dix-Halpike maneuver is the maneuver of choice. So the patient's going to sit down, turn their head uh, to the side, and um, lay back from sitting while they turn the head to the other side. And uh, they'll get the feeling of vertigo, and they'll get their, um, their nystagmus going. Um, and if, if you see that, um, then you, you know it's benign paroxysmal positional vertigo, or at least you have a pretty good idea that it is. And uh, you have a way to treat it. So the Epley maneuver, uh, I'll talk about it on the next slide, but it's it's around 80% effective, and I've actually not seen a doctor do it. Uh, so I think that it's something that people are not uh, not utilizing as much as they should. And again, we'll talk a little bit about how to do it, but with both the Dix Hallpike maneuver and the Epley maneuver, you really need to go on YouTube and, uh, and watch a video. I've got a, a video under... Um, under my uh, one of my playlists that you can look up if you want to go to the, to the the channel. But a, an important no- note here is that you don't want to use meclizine um, or, or any of the vestibular um, the uh, uh, vestibular suppressants. And the reason for this is because it it inhibits the compensation that goes on. Um, in the brain for this uh, this dislodged otolith, and a lot of times people can get unstable. So especially if you've got an uh, elderly patient and you give them meclizine, then they're going to be less stable and more likely to break a hip or something. So the Epley maneuver, um, I could read you this slide. It probably wouldn't make much sense to you. So if you want to if you want to pause the screen and read through it, you can. But basically, you start um, with the patient uh, laying down, uh, or you start with the Dix Hallpike uh, maneuver, and then you're going to turn them 270, 270 degrees and bring them up in that same position. And that'll make sense if you watch the video. Next on our list is uh, Meniere's disease. I looked up uh, a few different pronunciations with this. Um, it could be Meniere's or Meniere's um, or, or Meniere's, which is the most French sounding, so I'm going to go with that one. Uh, Meniere's disease sounds, sounds smarter when I say it. So um, It's caused by, uh, possibly by endolymphatic high drops, or, or basically too much fluid in those semicircular canals. So uh, they're not totally sure why that would be, and they, they haven't really nailed that down as the cause, but that's, that's what they still think is the cause. And it's going to look like a recurrent um, separate episodes of, of vertigo, and each episode will last hours to days. And uh, they al- you also get some hearing loss, and this is key because we'll, we'll see this being different in some of the other uh, diseases that we're going to go over. So uh, f- hearing loss, especially of low frequencies, um, tinnitus or ringing in the ears, or a feeling of fullness in the ears are all associated with uh, Meniere's disease. <coughs> uh, nausea and vomiting is also common, and uh, it is common with basically all these that we'll talk about. 
So the diagnosis is, it is made mostly just on those symptoms that we just talked about. You have to have at least two episodes lasting a half hour apiece. There has to be some hearing loss um, that you see with audiometry and uh, some tinnitus or uh, fullness in the ears. And the way you treat it um, is classically with low-sodium diet and diuretics, and we still do that. But um, we try like uh, some of the migraine diets, um, the migraine medications, sometimes benzodiazepines, and antiemetics, uh, like mechelzine, for example, can all be can all be used to treat this. And there's not a, a real consensus from what I can say see about uh, what first line therapy is for for Meniere's disease, but it is reasonably manageable from what it looks like in the literature. A vestibular migraine uh, is is basically. Uh, a migraine that affects the vestibular apparatus. So, so this affects a lot of people that have migraines. About 10% will have some some vertigo with their migraines, and it doesn't necessarily happen at the same time, but it, but it often does. So, if you have uh, people with with chronic migraines, uh, a lot of times with photophobia, and they're getting uh, this dizziness, then um, and this is probably a, a vestibular migraine. And uh, the big point here is that there's no auditory symptoms because really this looks just like Meniere's disease. Um, if, for example, if there's no headaches, uh, then this will look exactly like Meniere's disease um, besides the fact that there's not going to be any auditory symptoms like the tinnitus, the fullness, or the hearing loss. So... Again, it's a clinical diagnosis. I think I've got this written on all these slides here. And you kind of just put these pieces together. You want to especially, though, with this one, rule out episodic ataxia, type 2. Um, and this you can rule out with genetic testing. I didn't know anything about episodic ataxia, type 2, so I, I looked it up. And uh, basically, it's just uh, just how it sounds. You know, episodic and ataxia, you, uh, you get some... Uh, vestibular problems, and it happens uh, throughout your life. So if there's a vestibular migraine uh, that isn't associated with headaches, that isn't going away with treatment, you might want to do some testing for uh, episodic ataxia type 2. So migraine medication should keep this under control. Migraine diets and lifestyle changes that are all associated with uh, migraines. And then uh, benzos, I've got asterisks here just because it's kind of questionable whether or not they're going to help, but a lot of people try them. Labyrinthitis is a, another pretty common uh, condition. Vestibular neuritis is, is pretty close to the same thing. It's just the, the itis is in a different spot. So when we're talking about itises, a lot of times uh, the causes are the same, just anything that causes inflammation. Here, viral is the most common, but you can ca you can get a an labyrinthitis or a vestibular neuritis from trauma, from bacterial infections, from stresses, from drugs. All those things can cause a, a labyrinthitis or vestibular neuritis. It's going to look like a acute onset of vertigo, uh, often with loss of balance or. Uh, um, Loss of tolerance for movement in the head. Uh, nausea, vomiting. I don't think there's really diarrhea. I think I just accidentally put diarrhea on there. Um, tinnitus and hearing loss, ear fullness, are all associated with labyrinthitis, not so much with vestibular neuritis because that's a, uh, not going to affect the same nerve. So uh, the diagnosis is uh, mostly one of exclusion and, again, uh, mostly clinical. But uh, you're going to test for an abnormal vestibular ocular reflex. And I, I was going to look up exactly how that works, but, but I didn't. So that would probably be a good one to check another YouTube video on, the vestibular ocular reflex. That's something you can do in the office. Um, horizontal nystagmus, where it beats to the opposite side of the lesion. 
and uh, we'll, we'll do an MRI again if, uh, if we're worried about a stroke, if there's a lot of uh, head and neck pain associated with this, um, inability to stand, same things we talked about before. This you can treat with corticosteroids to re reduce the itis, the inflammation, and uh, vestibular sedatives can be used like, like meclizine. This last one is, is kind of in a different class, and, and I don't know that it necessarily should have been included here, but, but in uh, review books it will be included with, with vertigo. So um, vasovagal syncope, like we talked about, is going to have some of that more vascular uh, type presentation where um, it's not as much about uh, spinning of the room or um, nausea and vomiting. But, uh, but more just a, a lightheadedness uh, with near syncope or syncope. And the, the history of this is going to have um, triggers like uh, standing up, um, emotional triggers, uh, happiness, uh, uh, worry are, are going to cause this, um, pain, sleeplessness, urination, defecation, uh, sex and tickling can all... Uh, trigger this along with a lot of other things. And the, the main thing uh, to treat it is just to avoid the triggers. People also use some beta blockers to, to treat this with um, some success, but the, the big thing is probably just to control uh, the situations and, and not, uh, not get triggered uh, by this. Um, so some of, the, some of the patients that I've seen, for example, um, couldn't couldn't watch the their favorite TV show, uh, or if they did watch it, they had to just really be careful not to laugh too hard uh, because they would they would get um, syncope. So um, there's one picture of nystagmus that I actually don't think it ended up here on the slides, um, so that that one doesn't matter, but. Uh, I did want to make a note that uh, anybody who wanted to to get involved um, and and help out with this project, first of all, a, a comment is really valuable because it helps us to make these video better. Videos better. Um, if you like or favorite or share the video, that helps out too. Um, but really, we could use some volunteers uh, to help with uh, with the project. The first phase of this project is to get a, a full scale. Step one and step two, uh, USMLA review uh, online, and step uh, phase two of the project is to get uh, a full medical school with all the curriculum of medical school uh, online for free. So, give me uh, an email or uh, leave a comment if you want to help out, and uh, we'll follow up with more videos soon.